to do but to one of the men in the congregation and um, say and visit with us and let us get to know you better. Um, also, the Lord's Supper elements are located on the tables in the foyer in the back. If anybody says he needs those today for the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Um, as far as the sick list, let's continue to remember our regular shut-ins that, that are listed in the bulletin that include Sister Darnell, Sister Linda McClure, Young, and um, Carl Hollis, who is still at home. Um, we do have Sister Shirley Berry with us, and she's continuing to prove following her surgery, so we're grateful to have her with us today. Um, she will start chemo June 1st with approximately six treatments planned. And um, I heard her talking to Brother Mike and said the doctors are optimistic about the treatment plans so far, so let's rejoice with Sister Shirley Berry and that good news. Also, continue to remember Brenda Fasulo, who's at home recovering from knee replacement surgery. Also, continue to remember Sister Amanda Erickson, Valerie Milgram said, Janice Glover, um, family, uh, members, family members of the members here, sorry. Um, Amy Brace, the dad's brother, Brenda Sula's mother, Stephanie Hart's grandmother, Sheila Brockham's brothers, Dwayne Cooper's aunt, um, also Hudson Lavender, who's the young daughter of Jeff Brand, who's battling leukemia at the moment. Um, most importantly, for the spiritually sick, let's do what we can to, to look to those who, who are struggling spiritually or maybe do not come to know the Lord and do the things we can to, to help out in those areas. Let's continue to remember the Burns family and pray for them and pass them to Sister Billy and also uh, continue to remember the Jackie Turnbow family and uh, his passing this week, that's Miss Martha Martin's nephew. Um, and Brother Wade told me this morning that the memorial service for Jackie will be this afternoon at the Powell Funeral Home in Kent, Missouri at 4 p.m. Um, also continue to remember that we have the Tuesday morning Bible class at 10 a.m., which is being done in person and via Zoom. And our order of services this morning, um, our opening prayer will be by Brother Ronnie Fossey. And Greg, Brother Greg Pillow will be leading our song service. And the first song will be number 308 if you're using the hymnal. 308 if you're using the hymnal will also be on the monitor behind us. Um, Lord's Supper reading will come from Brother Tim Johnson. And that scripture will be 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 in the Lord's the Lord Supper reading. Brother Bill Milder will be assisting in the Lord's table this morning. <coughs> scripture reading before the sermon will come from Brother Michael Ward, and that will be 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And our closing prayer will be brought to us by Brother Eric Branson. We now start to this time.
These things you ask your son as holy men. Oh. 
Scripture reading to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper will be taken from 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God is manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Let us give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we come to you now thanking you for this bread. We come to you with the realization that it represents the body of your Son, Jesus. And we pray that those of us who partake of it will do so in a way that be pleasing to your sight. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
this is the message which we have heard from him and announced unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have free fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do it. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. <coughs> Glad that you're here this morning, and I hope you got your Bibles with you. We have a number of issues in the audience. I certainly appreciate your presence here this morning. I want to encourage you to get your Bible out. If you have any questions about anything that we say or that we do, then feel free when service is over to ask those questions, and we'll try to give a Bible answer to those questions. It is our aim to do everything that we do by the authority of God's Word and to be able to put our finger on a book and a chapter and a verse for that. And so. Uh, we're not at all offended by anybody that would ask a question or challenge us to, to be able to give a Bible verse for what we practice. You know, we all understand, I believe, that once we have reached the point of accountability that we have all sinned. Romans 3 and verse 23 is probably a Bible verse that we learn in our younger years where the Bible said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is in the midst of a three chapter context where the Apostle Paul is pointing out the need that we have for the gospel and the need we have for Jesus Christ. Not only does the Bible say that we've all sinned in the passage that Michael just read for us, to say otherwise is to make us a liar and to tell God that he is not telling the truth. In 1 John 1, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the Bible says, and the truth is not in us. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar, the Bible tells us. And we all understand that fact. In fact, at least among everybody I know, and I think probably that exception, there's not a person in the audience this morning that wouldn't say, I have sinned and I transgress God's law. And because we have sinned and transgressed God's law, we all recognize the need that we have for forgiveness. To have those sins wiped away and washed away by God or, or blotted out. We need those remitted because sin has a high wage attached to it. You know, sometimes people might look at sin and think, well, it's no big deal. But the Bible says the wage of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we pray for forgiveness of our sin. Matthew 6 and verse 12. Very seldom do I hear anybody pray that they don't offer a prayer for forgiveness of our sins. But my question is not this morning whether or not we have sinned because we all will admit that. Or whether or not we all see the need to be forgiven of our sins because of that exception. We all would say we need to be forgiven. But the question that I want to ask this morning is do you really appreciate your forgiveness? That is beyond the lip service that we pay to sin and forgiveness. Do we really appreciate the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus? When we begin to think about that question, let me point out the fact that the Bible draws a connection between appreciating our forgiveness or our salvation and our faithfulness to God. When we do not appreciate our forgiveness, when we don't appreciate the salvation that we enjoy in Christ Jesus, that leads to lukewarmness. That leads to unfaithfulness and a lack of spiritual growth. For example, turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, that should say, not verse 3, chapter 1. And in verse 9, do you remember that Peter is talking about the Christian graces in 1 Peter chapter 1? And that the need we have to grow spiritually, and not 
mighty in First Peter. That's Second Peter. I really messed that one up on the chart. Second Peter, chapter one, where he talks about adding to our faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness uh, love. He's talking about growing spiritually. And he tells us we need to give all diligence here in this text to be growing in that way. But what happens if we're not growing? What, what, what causes one that has obeyed the gospel not to be increasing in knowledge, not to be developing brotherly love, not to be developing more self-control? Notice what he says in verse 9. He who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. The Apostle Peter said, when you see someone that isn't developing these qualities, I think what the problem is, they're short-sighted, which means they're focused on the here and the now, but the other problem is they've really forgot about their cleansing. Does that mean that these individuals didn't pay lip service to forgiveness? No, I expect that everyone that he has in mind, if you ask them, have you been forgiven? They probably would have said yes. If you asked them, had they sinned, I'm confident they probably would have said yes, but they really lost sight of what forgiveness means and the high price paid to secure that for them. Not only do I learn the connection between faithfulness and appreciating forgiveness, in first, or 2 Peter chapter 1, I learned that also in the parable of the two debtors. Do you remember the story in Luke chapter 7? In Luke chapter 7, we read of an incident in the life of our Lord where a woman came into the house where Jesus was eating. He was at one of the Pharisees' house. And this woman came in and she began to wash Jesus, uh, wash his feet with her tears and, and, uh, and to wipe it with her hair. We don't know a lot about this woman's background. This is not, by the way, Mary who does that, uh, or Martha, I mean Mary, excuse me, who does that later on in the last week of our Lord's life. This is another incident very similar to it, but it's a different story. But here's what the Bible tells us about this woman. It just says the woman was a sinner. I take from that, not just that the Bible is identifying her as a person who sinned, they can describe anybody. But here's a woman who's probably, whose sinful life was well known. It was notorious. Others knew that she was a sinner. And in the background of this story, or this parable that Jesus is going to relate, those that were present began to say, this man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of woman it was that was touching him, for she's a sinner. The implication is, if he knew about her background, he wouldn't even let her near him. Certainly not to wash his feet with her tears and hair. And so the Lord related this parable then of the two debtors. And in this parable, you have a creditor. And this creditor has two people that owe him money. One person owes him 500 denarii. That's 500 days wages, a little over a year's worth of wages. The other person owed him 50 denarii. It still could be a substantial amount, but nowhere near what the first person owed. Someone said it's the difference in owing somebody 10,000 and owing somebody $100,000. There's a big difference in those debts, aren't And the question that was raised by Jesus, which one of them, by the way, in the story, neither one could repay. Neither one had an ability to repay. And so that likely meant that they would have been placed in prison, perhaps, if they could not pay. They didn't have any, any money to pay that debt back with. And the creditor forgave them both of that. And Jesus said, which of them will love him more? Which one of those two do you think is going to be more grateful? And Simon said, I suppose the one he forgave. The one with the bigger debt. That's the one that would be more appreciative of that. And Jesus committed it because he had rightly answered that. Now the point is, and you and I can relate to this, there's a big difference in owing somebody an amount I can repay, or even forgiving a debt that is small versus the one that's forgiven a large debt. What's the point of that there? I think Lipsky's probably right when he comments on it and says, 
Is Jesus saying that the more we sin, the more God has to forgive, the more we have to love Him? And putting, as it were, a premium on the quantity of our sin? Well, no, that's not what He's saying at all. Sort of the question that was raised in Romans chapter 6, shall we continue to sin the grace of man You know, should I just sin more so God can forgive more? And the more God forgives, then the more I can express my love toward God. Is that what He's saying? He said the difficulty vanishes when we observe that Jesus describes the debt of sin not objectively but subjectively. Not so much many actual sins, but so much consciousness of sin, which is never equal to the actual amount of our sins. They who sin least and least frequently often feel their sins more, far more than the wicked men do. And sins like pride, selfishness, work, work righteousness, hypocrisy, and unbelief are often not felt at all. What is he saying? What he's saying is the point Jesus is making is not just the more, more, more we sin, the more we appreciate God, but the more we come to appreciate the fact that uh, uh, of the enormity of our sin, then when we really appreciate that, then we're going to reciprocate that in our attitude toward the Lord. But the Lord obviously is drawing a connection between appreciation of our forgiveness and our faithfulness to God. There are some examples, I believe, in scriptures of those who truly appreciated their forgiveness and what it did for them. I think when I think about those that truly came to appreciate their forgiveness, I think about the Apostle Paul. The book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1, beginning at verse 12 and continuing through verse 17, the Apostle Paul talked about how he thanked Jesus Christ our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You know, Paul appreciated his forgiveness because Paul realized where he had been and what God had saved him from. He wanted to answer the question, how could Paul endure all the persecutions he endured? How Paul could be so faithful in the midst of adversity? How Paul could make a statement like, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself? I tell you, the answer is, Paul had truly come to appreciate the forgiveness and the salvation that he enjoyed in Christ Jesus. <laughs> That's why in verse 15 and verse 10, Paul said, that by the grace of God, I am what I am. And as a result of that, the point the Apostle Paul is making in that text, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Paul truly appreciated the forgiveness that he enjoyed in Christ. Okay, I think David enjoyed the forgiveness that he enjoyed at the hands of the Lord. Maybe previous to the event of, of 2 Samuel 12, David may not have realized the, how great the forgiveness of God was as much as he came to realize it after that event in his life. Do you remember in Psalm chapter 32, that psalm of repentance that David writes after he committed his sin with Bathsheba? It begins with a statement, Blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is he whose uh, to the Lord does not uh, impute iniquity, and in his spirit there is no guile. He said, you just think how blessed it is to be forgiven by God. Not only that, he goes on to point out, you know what, this forgiveness that I've received is so great, I want to share that with others. I want to talk about it. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. In fact, he said back in verse 6, for this calls everybody that's godly should pray. That everybody will come to appreciate and see the forgiveness of God as I do. In fact, it causes me to be glad and rejoice and to shout, he said, for joy. David, after having that weight of sin on his shoulders, came to appreciate the forgiveness of God and that motivated him. He said, I want to share this message with other people. Or I think about the Gentiles at Antioch of Pisidia in Acts chapter 13. We could talk about other examples, but Acts chapter 13 and verse 48. Do you remember in Antioch of Pisidia that the Apostle Paul came and he goes into the synagogue and he preaches the gospel? And initially, the Jews want to hear that message, and then by the next week, they don't want to hear anything about it. They're ready to run him out of town. 
In fact, Paul would say to the Jews there at Antioch that you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. But now this gospel message is preached to the Gentiles. Here's what it said about them. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord and as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. They, they were excited about that message and the very next verse says, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. You know why? They appreciated their forgiveness. And not only did they appreciate the fact they have been forgiven, they wanted that message to be shared with others. I wonder, does my appreciation for forgiveness and salvation, is it like the Apostle Paul's? Is it like David's? Is it like the John House and Antioch of the city? If there's a connection between my faithfulness, my enthusiasm, and my zeal for the Lord, and appreciation of forgiveness, I want to come to appreciate that even more. So how can I do that? How can I come to appreciate my forgiveness as I should? Well, let's talk about that. Well, number one, I must appreciate what we were before being forgiven. I think to truly appreciate our forgiveness, we've got to recognize what we were before we were forgiven. Before our obedience and our forgiveness, we were a sinner. We were separated from God. In Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 through verse 8, the Apostle Paul points out that when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What were we prepared for our forgiveness? We were sinners separated from God. I do understand that there's a sense in which we could still apply the name sinner to the individual after they've obeyed the gospel because we still sin and transgress God's law. But if you look at the word sinner throughout the scriptures, it's, it, there's a contrast drawn between one that was a sinner and one that has obeyed the gospel. If you look over in the book of 1 Peter, for example, the question is raised, if the righteous are scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? For if righteous, uh, for time is come for judgment to begin at the house of God, See the contrast? If you're in the house of God, you know sins have been forgiven, they've been taken away. Prior to obedience to the gospel, he said you're ungodly, you're a sinner. Is that how we view ourselves? When I look back at my time prior to being a Christian, prior to having my sins washed away, or even after I've sinned, after I obeyed the God, how do I view myself? Do I just view myself as a person that was a good person who slipped a time or two? Do I view myself as somebody that was good, moral, or basically a good person, or do I see myself as one that was a sinner in need of the grace of God? You know what you were prior to obedience to the gospel? You were foolish, and you were disobedient, and you were deceived. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, the apostle Paul said, we ourselves were also once foolish and disobedient and deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Paul said, here's what we were prior to obedience to the gospel. By the way, to the context where he's saying, that's why we treat others with kindness and mercy is because that's where we were, wasn't it? We had disobeyed God. We had rebelled against His name. We were disobedient to His gospel. That's why we, that's what sin is. And that's why we need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do we realize that prior to forgiveness, we were a wretched man? In Romans chapter 7, 13 to 25, is that... A passage, a passage, I think, that sometimes has been much abused. Beginning at verse 13 through verse 25, the Apostle Paul describes, I believe he's describing himself under the law. Prior to the coming of Christ. I, I, I sort of cringe sometimes when individuals say Paul is describing the Christian. Are there some things in this text that can describe the struggle we go through after we obey the gospel? Absolutely. But I tell you what, when Paul describes himself as one soul under sin, is one under the captivity of sin. That's not a description of a Christian. He's describing himself prior to his obedience to the gospel under the law. And then he comes back at the end and he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So when I, uh, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, with the flesh the, the law of sin, there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So it is a contrast between the one outside of Christ and the one inside of Christ. But here's what I want you to notice in that. The Apostle 
Apostle Paul describes himself as one that wanted to do good. But even though he wanted to do good, sometimes he did that which was evil. I mean, Paul, I think I would say, I, we could say, was basically a good person, wasn't he? He wanted to do what's right. He didn't know the conscience before God in his day. He said that even though uh, the good that I will do, sometimes I fail to do, I want to do good, but sometimes I, I don't do the good I want to do. Now, I find the law of the evil is present with me, and the one who wills to do good trying to lie in the law of God according to the inner man. I will, but, he said, there's this other law that's born against it, the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And this is what he said in verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Here's the point Paul's making. In spite of his best efforts, guess what? He had failed. He was separated from God and under the law as one unforgiven. That left him in a wretched condition. He needed Jesus. I wonder sometimes if that's how we view it. Do we view ourselves as individuals? Yes, we were trying to do right. Yes, our intentions may have been well, but guess what? We failed in that, and prior to Christ's forgiveness, we were in a wretched, terrible condition. You want to truly appreciate your forgiveness, I tell you what you have to do. You have to recognize where you were prior to your obedience to the gospel. You were a sinner. You were one that was disobedient and foolish. You were in a wretched condition. Condition. How do you see yourself before you were forgiven? That is something else I've got to do. If I want to truly appreciate my forgiveness, I have got to appreciate the horror of sin. I've got to really appreciate how bad sin is. You know how the Bible describes sin? The Bible describes sin as a sick body. Wounds of putrefying sores from the top of the head to the bottom of the, the feet. I tell you, if you go through, we're going to go through a number of here, you just look at the picture that sin is given in the Bible. It's an ugly picture. It, it, there, there are times you can almost turn your stomach to think about the description that is given of sin in the Bible. And we have to be reminded, sin is ugly. Sin is not a beautiful thing. That's, that's what the world wants. That's how the devil wants to present it. But while it promises liberty, it leads us in captivity. While it promises us, uh, offers us freedom, it makes us slave. It's described as, as vomit and mud. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 talks about those that go back into sin as a, a dog returning to his vomit. The sound having been washed or wallowing in the mire. It's described as a burden that's too heavy to bear. Psalm chapter 38. Psalm chapter 38. Verses 4 through verse 6, the psalmist said, My iniquities have gone over my head like a burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Really, really two descriptions in that. First of all, the, his foul and festering wounds. But second, have you ever tried to carry something that's just too heavy for you to carry? You just sort of bow down underneath the load. And the, the picture there is that of, as, as, that's the picture of sin given in Psalm chapter 38, this, this burden that one can't possibly bear with on their own. They're being crushed beneath the load. It is a cruel and abusive master. In John 8, verse 34, Jesus did back in verse 32, the passage we all know, you should know the truth, the truth should set you free. And the Jews said, how, how can they say we shall be set free? We're Abraham's children. We've never been in bondage to anyone. And Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say unto you that whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. It becomes our master. It can control us. And it's a cruel master. It is a cruel master. Because it is a master that will ultimately lead to our death and to our destruction. It is an unmanageable death. Matthew chapter 18 and 23 to 25. I'm not going to take time to read that entire entire text, but you and I are familiar with this, this story of the unforgiving servant. And it's really a story that is designed to tell us we need to be forgiven, uh, forgiving toward others. But in that story, he, he relates the servant that owed his master 10,000 talents, the Bible tells us in that text. Matthew chapter 18, 10,000 talents is what he owed him. My, my understanding is 10,000 talents. One talent equaled 10,000 denarii. So 
So one talent, 10,000 denarii. A denarii is a day's wage. So one talent, if it equals 10,000 denarii, is 10,000 days wages. To put that in perspective, it would require the average man to work 273,973 years to earn that kind of money to pay the debt. Somebody figured it did some bigger, or I did it one point. If, if you make $50 a day today, that's not a lot of money, is it? If you make $50 a day, that meant that debt would be $5 billion. Can you imagine if you went to your mailbox tomorrow? And you opened up the mailbox and you opened it up and you had a bill for five billion dollars. What are you going to do? You're going to say, there's no way I can pay that. You might wonder how you end up five billion dollars in debt. Maybe the one thing you, but if you got a debt somewhere like that, you think there's absolutely what no way I could ever get out from under that. I can work as hard as I want to. I can make good investments. I can make, but there's no way you'll ever get out from under five billion dollars of debt. In contrast to that, the other servant, by the way, owed him simply what was the amount of about twenty thousand dollars, using the same figures. It's still debt, but you know, if you had a twenty thousand dollar debt, you might be able. What? Can you see the end, maybe someday? And of course, the point is, what we owe the, uh, what others have done against us pales in comparison to what we've done against the Lord. And so while that parable is obviously designed to tell us we need to be forgiven, I need something I learned about it, is I owe the Lord something I can never repay. It is absolutely unmanageable debt. It is a blemishing stain. Remember in Isaiah chapter 1, he said, Come and let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be made as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword from the mouth of the Lord. We sing a song, Though our sins be as scarlet. It is this deep red stain. And the Lord has said, I can wash it. I need to appreciate my forgiveness. I need to appreciate how sin is described and how bad it is. Not only because of its description, but because of what it does to you. You know what sin does to you? Every sin does to you. It separates you from God. The passage that Michael read pointed out, we can't have fellowship with God and walk in darkness. We don't walk in darkness then we, we can have that relationship. And then God is in the light, and those that have fellowship with Him must be in the light as well. That's why when we sin, we, can, we want the forgiveness that those verses offer to us. <coughs> Isaiah 59 and 1 and 2 said, The Lord's hand is short that He cannot save, nor is your heavy that He cannot hear. But your sins have separated you from your God, or your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have been his face from you. So you, will not. you know what sin does? It separates, it drives a wedge between you and God. It leaves us dead spiritually. I, one of the passages I like in some of the newer translations better than I do the, the old King James and the new King James, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. One reason I like the newer ones better, the, the new King James and the old King James had a phrase he made alive. And you, he made alive, who were dead and trespasses and sin. That's true. It's true statement. In fact, the rest of that chapter brings it out. That, but that's not how the chapter really starts. You may notice even the italics and some of that. You know how the chapter begins? You were dead in trespasses and sins. What the Apostle Paul is wanting to get them to understand? If you realize where you were, you were dead spiritually. It brings misery and suffering. When we realize that that separation from God. Remember David, as he describes how his bones grew old and his groanings all the day long. It leads us in that wretched condition of Romans chapter 7 and in verse 24. And it ends in eternal damnation. You remember in Romans chapter 6? Where the Apostle Paul is dealing with the question, shall we continue to send the grace of mankind? The, the idea seems to be if they had not presented this argument, Paul anticipated somebody making this argument. Well, if we're saved by the grace of God, then the more I sin, the more I give God an opportunity to show His grace. 
So sin is not necessarily a bad thing. So let, let's just go ahead and sin. Well, Paul deals with that throughout Romans chapter 6. He points out, first of all, when we obeyed the gospel, we made the decision to die to sin. You don't bury a live man, you bury a dead man, and to be a fit candidate for baptism, you've got to make the decision to die to sin. That's the point. But he goes on at the end of that chapter, and he said, what fruit do those things have which are now ashamed? What good? When Paul raises the question, what fruit did those things have which are now ashamed? This is the question he was asking. Name for me just one good thing that sin ever did for you. What good thing came out of your transgression of God's law? He said the end of those things is what? The end of those things is death. And in verse 23 he said the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You know where sin leads? It leads to eternal damnation. It leads not only to our being separated from God now, it leads to a punishment in hell for eternity. And God's offered me the possibility that I could be forgiven of those things I've done. And I could escape that punishment. Now, can you want to truly appreciate your forgiveness? You've got to realize how the horror of sin, by realizing what it's compared to, realizing what it does for me. You know, you come to appreciate your forgiveness, we must appreciate what God does when He we need to understand forgiveness. That I have transgressed God's law more than once. It separated me from God. It left a blemish that I couldn't get out on my own. I, it left me sick spiritually. I was, I was dead. I was in a wretched condition. And God provided the plan. He said, you know what, Mike? I'll, I'll just wipe it all over. Acts 3 and verse 19. The Apostle Paul says, repent. Or the Apostle Peter, excuse me, says in Acts chapter 3 and in verse 19, he said that we are to repent and be converted, that your sins, he said, may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He blots them out, he removes them. He, he not only remember, he remembers them no more. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12, the Hebrew writer is talking about how much better the new law is than the old law. He goes back to the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 31 about he's going to make a new law with the house of Israel. And one of the things that was unique about that new covenant that he was going to make with them is the Lord said, For their merciful, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. We've been spending some time in the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament on Sunday mornings. We've talked about all the sacrifices of the book of Leviticus. We've talked about uh, last week all the sacrifices that were offered in the daily sacrifice and the new moon and the, the Passover. And not one of them did anything about sin. Every year they had to come back and remember not just their sins of the past year, but all the sins of the past. They were never completely taken away. And the Lord said, I'm offering you the opportunity. you go to obey my will to have those taken away and I'll never bring them up again. I'll remember them no more. Not only will he remember them no more, he covers them. Romans chapter 4 and verses 6 through verse 8. David describes the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord does not impute, uh, that the, whom the Lord imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute iniquity. Where are the two teachers there? Number one, their sins are covered, they're forgiven. But two, they're not on our account. It's an, it's an accounting term. And the idea there is we have sinned. We have transgressed. But when God forgives us, that's no longer on our account. So that our account now stands justified, it's balanced, because we have been forgiven by the Lord. You ever owe somebody money and somebody just say, you know what, just forget about it. Or about it. The Lord said, you've got this tremendous debt, but I'll forgive you, and it's not on your account anymore. Not only has it been, been he cast out, been covered, he cast them behind his back. Isaiah chapter 38 and in verse 17, indeed it was for our own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, and you cast all my sins behind your back. He has removed them far from us. Psalm 103 and verse 12. As far as the east from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. 
The east, you don't get further away than the east from the west. What the Lord is saying, you don't know how far the east is from the west. That's how far my sins have been removed from you. And other times when I forget, they're completely gone. He said he cast them into the depth of the sea, Micah 7 and verse 19. He hides his face from them. Psalm 51 and verse 9, David said, Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. He does not impute them or count them against us any longer. We already noticed that in Romans 4, 7 and 8. And he restores the offender to the former position. Perhaps there's no more cheerful story in Luke and all the Bible. The story of that prodigal son of Luke 15. You know, one of the things perhaps that makes it such a, a heart-rending story is in many ways we can relate to the love that a father might have for his son. And the pain it would cause for that son to be separated from his father as a result of his own decisions and own choices. Well, when I look at that story in Luke chapter 15, like Matthew 18, the primary point of Luke 15 is about the arrogant, self-righteous Pharisees. That's who he's addressing it to. But I learned so much more than just that about it. Do you remember where the young man came to himself and he said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to throw myself on my father's mercy and I'm going to tell him, you know what, I, I, I've made some terrible mistakes and I, I don't even deserve any longer to wear the name of son. Just, just make me a servant in your house. So he took courage and he went. The Bible tells us why he was still far off. The father saw him and ran and fell on his neck. Didn't restore him back to the, I didn't restore him to the or, or put him in the position of a servant, but restored him to the full benefits of a son. Give him a fatted calf. He said, you know, let's make merry. For this my son was dead and now he is alive. Do you know when God forgives us? And it's illustrated that's Luke 15. He doesn't just bring us back part of the way. He doesn't bring us back and put us on parole, but he brings us back. We are restored right back to the position we were as if we had never. I don't know about you, that's mind boggling It is when I think about how hard it can be sometimes to forgive others, how hard it can be sometimes to let the mistakes and the errors of the past go. I'm just amazed at the love that God has for me and for you that He can save like you never did at all. You're right back where you need to be. Or where you should have been all along. You want to appreciate your forgiveness. Do what you gotta do. You gotta appreciate what God does when He forgives. You want to appreciate your forgiveness? I mean, what you got to do, you've got to realize what forgiveness is like. You know what forgiveness is like? It's like having a debt cancel. I tell you, you, can you imagine how excited you'd be if you got something in the bank from, in the mail from your mortgage company and they just said, don't worry about it. Don't take care of it. You don't owe anything anymore. If you could understand that, you're only beginning to relate to what it's like to have the Lord say, you owed so much you could ever repay, and yet I canceled the debt. Or what about the, the healing of a disease? In Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 15, the hardest people have grown dull, the Lord said, and their ears are hard of hearing. And they should, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, show that I should heal them. And in 9 verse 27, to those who are well in no position, but they that are sick. The Bible often compares sin to sickness, not because we can catch it without our will, but because it's something we can relate to about how serious it is. The Bible describes sin, depending on your translations, with terms like gangrene or cancer. Some of you can relate to this point. Can you imagine the joy of going into a doctor's office? after you've been diagnosed with some disease, some sickness, and having the doctor sit down and look across the table and said, it's gone. It's gone. You know, you don't have to worry about it anymore that you have been healed of whatever it was that you were suffering. If you can relate to that, you know that's what God has done for us on a far greater level when it comes to our forgiveness. Can you imagine the joy of being pardoned for a crime that deserved the death penalty? are released from slavery, are reconciled to someone that you have been separated from. Sometimes you watch television shows, and I've seen television shows where maybe there's some family members that were separated for many years through no fault of their own. Or maybe it was even a 
some of these young babies were separated and they really didn't even know about each other for a long period of time. And now they found out. And you see the joy of a relationship restored. Can you imagine the joy of realizing I was separated from God? I could not call him my father. I did not have a relationship with him. I could not cast my cares upon him. And yet, God offered me the opportunity to obedience to the gospel through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven and I'll have that relationship restored. How can we not appreciate what God has done for us? But let, let me emphasize this before we, we close. That forgiveness is not unconditional. There are conditions attached to it. The Lord has offered it to everybody. But the Lord said, if you want that forgiveness, you've got to obey. They have many cost. The people cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And, the, and Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission or forgiveness of your sin. You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized. And you've got to continue to serve the Lord. You know what happens when I truly come to appreciate what God's done for me? I'm talking about not just paying lip service to it. Not, not, not just saying, well, I know I've sinned. I've been forgiven. But when I truly come to appreciate you know what happens? I tell you, when you truly do, then you look for an effort to grow spirit. I think, well, look at what he did for me. I think, what well, I want to grow in knowledge, self control. Because remember, Peter said, if I like those things, because I didn't really appreciate my cleansing. I want to share that message of forgiveness with others. Like David said, I want you to enjoy the forgiveness, the blessings that come from having that forgiveness from the Lord. And I tell you what's going to happen, I'm going to learn to labor more abundantly. You think, by the way, when I begin to appreciate the forgiveness of God as I should that other things won't begin to fall into place. You think when I really appreciate the forgiveness of God, I'll start asking questions like, oh, do I really have to do that? Does God really expect me to be there? Do I really have to make that sacrifice? No, I tell you what, when I come to truly appreciate that what God has done for me, then I'm not going to say, do I have to? I'm going to say, what more can I do? Just so they pray. Let me ask you the question. I asked myself the question this morning. Do you truly appreciate your Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't truly appreciate that forgiveness because you have not yet received that forgiveness. You've not received it because you've never yet rendered obedience to the gospel. Why not do that this morning? Hearing, believing, repenting, confession, and being baptized. That you may have those sins washed away. And then they thank for the gospel that you be here. Or maybe there's somebody here that's obeyed the gospel. But maybe after having obeyed the gospel, you've run it away, you've sinned in a public way. And God, the, the great thing about the God we serve, He's a God that's abundant in mercy. He's willing to forgive. No matter what we've done, no matter how many times we've sinned, He's willing to take us back. If there's something that separated you from God, why not be reconciled this morning by making those corrections in your life while you have the opportunity to do it? No matter what you're doing, why not respond to me right now so we stay? So, Savior, I
remind everybody of our uh, the evening service at 5 p.m. and encourage everyone to come come back this evening. It's been very good to be here. Number 210. <clears throat> Sing all three verses. Alone at Eve.